Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to another edition of our Ready for November Task Force. We've got, uh, of course, uh, Michelle Wilcox here from the Auglaize County Board of Elections, Lisa Welsh uh, from uh, Holmes County. We've got Brian Sleeth here as well from down in Warren County. Rob is taking a little bit of well-deserved uh, family time this week, but we've also got two really exciting guests that we're looking forward to hearing from. Uh, first up, we're going to be hearing from Jason McClure, who is here from Cedar Fair. And uh, this, of course, is the great Ohio-based company that operates Cedar Point and other terrific amusement parks. They've been very innovative in not only their approach to keeping their customers and their employees safe in the pandemic, but also for many years, they've built a great reputation on managing lines and queues and creating efficient ways to move people through their attractions. And so we're going to learn from, from him today about some of the great things that this terrific Ohio company has done over the years. And then we're also going to be hearing from Pete Ziegler. Pete is the director of the Geauga County Board of Elections. Up in Geauga County, they've been doing some really innovative stuff on poll worker recruitment and poll worker retention, keeping those longtime poll workers engaged and interested in the work. And so uh, we're going to be hearing from Pete in the second part. Uh, but just two updates as we get started. Um, it's been a, a big week for, for us, obviously. And, and uh, for us, uh, Labor Day has always been kind of a point of demarcation for elections officials. We, you know, we work on election stuff 365 days a year. But uh, once you get past Labor Day, that's kind of once the general public is really getting into election mode. And so for us, you know, uh, our, our big season uh, really starts at the end of this week and into next. And so this is a time of preparation for our boards of elections. As you can see, we've got our countdown clock. It says 32 days, 21 hours and 58 minutes until early voting begins. Of course, we know that uh, overseas and military voting begins even sooner. And uh, a big piece of news for us this week these have been appearing in mailboxes all over the state of Ohio. And what this is, is the absentee ballot request form. When you open it up, it looks like this inside with the instructions. And then on the back is, of course, the, the, the actual form. And then it includes a self-addressed envelope to make it super easy to mail it back to your Board of Elections. We know that millions of Ohioans, as we speak, are receiving those. Lauren and I got ours here in Columbus just yesterday. And uh, we'll be filling it out when I get home from work tonight and mailing it in right away. And we're hearing that a lot of boards of elections are already starting to receive a lot of absentee ballot requests. That is great news. It's great that right here in the beginning of September, people are already getting their absentee ballot requests in in record numbers. And of course, we continue to really focus on poll worker recruitment and everything else. But it's important for people to know a couple of things. And so you as elections leaders, as advocates, as, as informed Ohioans, please pass the word to your friends. First of all, get this filled out and in right away. We've also had some questions where people have said, you know, I printed my own a couple of weeks ago and mailed it in, or I got one of these that uh, some advocacy group or campaign sent me and I already mailed that in and they were confused about why they got a second one. Well, of course, when we say we're mailing this out to every registered voter, that's exactly what we mean. And so we sent this out to 7.8 million registered voters. So everybody who's a registered voter in the state of Ohio got one. If you've already filled one out, then you can disregard this one. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's just extra and that's, and that's fine. If you haven't filled one out, then fill it out and mail it in. We've also had some questions from people saying, uh, I mailed in my absentee ballot request, but I haven't gotten my absentee ballot yet. Well, good news. Uh, you shouldn't be getting an absentee ballot yet. Not until the 6th of October are boards of elections even permitted by law to start mailing those out. Again, except for overseas and military voters that get a couple weeks head start. And so for everybody that's mailed in their absentee ballot request, there's nothing more to do at this point other than maybe go to voteohio.gov and, and check to make sure that your board of elections has received it. But then uh, you'll probably be in that first batch that will go out in early October. And so be watching be watching for, for your ballot and then return that as soon as you can as well. A um, couple other questions people have said, why are you doing this this year? Well, I think you all know that this is nothing new, that we've done this uh, every even numbered year back to 2012. My predecessor began this practice and it's a simple way of just encouraging Ohioans to take advantage of this really convenient way of casting your ballot. And so this is nothing new. This is not something that we're doing specifically for the, the pandemic, although we're encouraging people to do it. And, and I can tell you that we've redesigned the form to make it more user friendly. We know that we're going to see a record number of uh, absentee ballot requests this year. And that's a good thing. And that's uh, something that the boards of elections are already well underway 
and working on. Uh, as you all know, the, the next thing uh, and the thing that we're continuing to work to, to try to get done is to advocate to the legislature to allow us to provide postage paid envelopes. They did that in the in the primary back in, in April, and it would make all the sense in the world to do it again in the general. Uh, the, the, the rationale back in the spring was in a, prime, in, a, in, a, in a pandemic, we want to encourage people to take advantage of voting from home. Well, we're still in a pandemic, unfortunately, and we still want to encourage people to vote from home. And so it really is the logical thing to do and the right thing to do for the legislature to authorize us to spend this money. Again, this is money that I've identified out of my own budget. Uh, it's a small price to pay, in my opinion, and it's something that we ought to be providing. But it's important that we correct the record on a couple of things. There's been some rumors out there circulating. I don't know if somebody's doing this intentionally or they're just not informed. Uh, but you know, they've said, for example, if you provide a business reply uh, envelope, that it's going to result in those not getting a postmark. False, 100% false. The Postmaster General of the United States personally confirmed to me in a conversation last week that business reply mail gets the cancellation. Uh, the, the postmark on it. Uh, some people have said that business reply mail doesn't move as fast as uh, as first class mail. That's false. We know this. This is demonstrably false. And so uh, whoever's out there, you know, spreading that people need to know the, the facts. Uh, also, uh, really what, what our proposal is because of the late hour now, because it's, you know, already early September and, and at the best case scenario, we won't get this authorization from the Ohio Controlling Board until September 14th. What our plan is, is to provide you all, the boards of elections, with those first class postage stamps. And so, again, it's it's not even a, a worry about whether it's a business reply envelope or not. We're just simply going to provide you with the postage. And so it will be a first class postage stamp uh, or the adequate amount of postage for your county's ballots. No question about it. And so anybody that's sort of raising those concerns out there, those are completely invalid. And I just wanted to make sure that people were aware of that. Now, um, Wanted to get to the to the business that we're here for today, and again, we're really excited uh, to have Jason McClure from Cedar Fair. And again, Cedar Fair, an Ohio-based company, employs a lot of people in this state. Does a great uh, thing, not only for the economy but for families uh, in Ohio to have an, an opportunity uh, for good family recreation. And uh, and I'm a, a fan myself, having been there with my girls frequently, and always get. Uh, a great experience when we visit Cedar Point. Now, anybody that's been there knows that uh, sometimes you have to wait in line. Of course, when it comes to elections, we do all we can to avoid lines, to avoid crowding. That's why we want to encourage people to vote early and absentee. But the fact is that in some locations, whether it's for the early voting centers or whether it's for the, the 4,000 polling locations around Ohio, there are sometimes going to be lines, uh, even though we try to avoid that. And so uh, with some tips and some advice, uh, on how really the best in the world do line management and uh, and creating a safe environment. I'm proud to welcome Jason from Cedar Fair. Jason, go ahead. Good morning. Uh, thanks for having me this morning. Uh, it's always great to talk about the park. It's a little bit different this year with a uh, some different types of priorities with uh, health and safety being first and foremost, uh, while still nice opportunity to give people some fun along the way. And to talk about line management is kind of great. Uh, we, we have a lot of experience with people waiting in lines. Uh, lots of times they're really excited to ride Millennium Force, so they don't necessarily uh, function the way they normally do. I'm sure everybody's going to be really excited to vote, too. So when they show up to vote, they're going to have some of those same kind of things in mind. So uh, our focus at Cedar Point this year was really three threefold when it came to lines, because social distancing is really the key. That's, that's the big change for us. So we looked at it from a communication standpoint, uh, from providing visual cues to our guests while they were in line, and then from a reinforcement standpoint for us as well. Uh, so when it, when it comes to communication, uh, when you visit our website prior to coming to the park, uh, either Cedar Point or Kings Island, which we'd always recommend you do that, uh, we have a page there that gives a lot of information about what your visit will be like and the experience. Um, it shows the type of signage that we'll have that has its own color palette that looks different from the other signage in the park that's related to social distancing when you come and visit and gives you that kind of feedback. And then when you arrive at the park as well, before you even enter, um, you'll see the same kind of signage reminding guests that while they're here, social distancing is important um, while you're in line. Sometimes lines may look longer than they actually are, 
because if everyone's social distancing six feet apart, um, they will extend further, but they'll they'll move quicker, which is a good thing for, for people to know in advance. And then visual cues, because we found that most of our guests don't have a problem social distancing, but they forget about it. Um, it's not been our human nature uh, for, for a long time to kind of put the, the social distancing uh, requirements in place. So, so they forget, like I said before, they get excited and they get closer together. So we put a lot of visual cues in place, starting with um, physical cueing, right? If you're in one of our ride lines, there's permanent physical cueing that's there. Uh, we have new lines in the park from restaurants and other places, and we've done temporary queuing in those, uh, whether tents of barriers or even uh, my, my favorite is when our great landscaping team puts a nice uh, potted uh, flower pot and puts rope in between so it, it kind of calms the situation there waiting in line. But we found a few times this year lines extend further than we expect. We've even put tape on the ground just as that visual cue to remind people to stay within this kind of aisleway for their line. Um, and then we also use decals on the ground of where your six foot distancing is, uh, just to make that reminder to people about this is, this is the six foot distance between the next person in line. Please continue to wait um, further back behind them. And then all of those things sometimes fail, right? Sometimes they're all not enough. So we have uh, other reinforcements that we put in place. We've got the ability to do some audio spiels that will play at, as you enter the park and in some of our lines around the park. But really the best way is our team. When our team's able to remind a guest um, nicely and politely, welcome them, hope they're excited about that ride they're about to get in Millennium Force, but please remember while you're waiting in line, um, follow the line markings in the queue, um, remain six feet apart from the other guests uh, before you get up to the ride to enjoy that experience. So um, largely, we've found a lot of success with those strategies. I think each one of them um, is an important part of the success of keeping people socially distanced. And, and at the end, the most important is our, uh, our team remaining you know, friendly with that smile that you can still see the smile from behind a mask and uh, just reminding guests frequently that they need the social distance while they're waiting in line. Hey, Jason, that's awesome. And it seems like a, a couple things that are that are really highlights here are um, having the right setup with barriers. And it doesn't have to, I know tents of barriers are expensive. Uh, maybe that's worth investing in for your early voting center, uh, which is obviously a fixed location that operates for four weeks. Uh, but at 4,000 polling locations all throughout the state of Ohio, it may not be possible to do that. But there are other things that you can use as barriers, even folding chairs with ropes tied between them or, or whatever else. There's a whole lot of different ways to do that for those, maybe those high traffic polling locations where you anticipate that kind of thing. Um, team members, I would call this active line management, right? Like I, having a person out there that's recognizable as somebody in charge. Um, you know, we don't put poll workers in a uniform, but in some counties they have a name tag that they wear or, or something else. And, and so a, respect, uh, a respected uh, authority figure who you know is the person in charge out there uh, giving you a friendly greeting and, and the right reminders. And I think that's important. And, and maybe this is something for our county elections officials to, to chime in on, but it seems like it's just best practice for those uh, precinct elections officials, especially the location managers to just sort of get up from the check-in table every now and then and, and, and walk the line and, and check with people and, and, and welcome them and see how they're doing. And then also useful distractions. And, I, and I'm holding my clipboard here, but like if there's a form that needs filled out in advance, uh, having your ID out ahead of time, um, even a, a one pager to hand people so they have something to read that goes through. These are all the safety precautions. We're doing this to protect you and we're gonna ask you to do this to protect us and your fellow voters as far as wearing a mask and social distancing. Are those all the kind of things that, that we need to focus on sort of useful distractions, uh, active line management and barriers and setup? Yeah, all of those, you know, people, people just in nature don't enjoy waiting in line but there's ways to make it enjoyable and make the time um, pass faster. So to have something to do while you're in line, if you're gonna have to do it anyway, um, to help engage them so that they're not just sitting there waiting is always um, always a positive. Uh, we, we distract our guests in line with a lot of different methods, whether it's music, 
or TVs in the queue. Um, Wi-Fi helps. If you've got Wi-Fi access, that's a good thing. But I think the more people can engage in something to help prepare um, before they get ready to vote, it definitely makes the time go by faster. Wonderful. And obviously, when we set these things up, we have to keep in mind ADA population. Uh, certainly, Jason, as, as we were talking about yesterday, you you welcome a very diverse set of customers that come to your parks, uh, and and it's the same way for voters. Uh, we uh, you know we say every vote counts, every voice counts, and in Ohio, that means every shape and size and and every level of ability or disability. We want to make sure that we set those up in such a way that they're accommodating. Uh, and so like those chicanes where you have people weaving around, that may be difficult to, to navigate for somebody in a wheelchair unless the turns are wide enough and, and that kind of thing, right? Yeah, that's important. Everywhere that we have a queue in the park, we make we make sure that those turn radiuses are there so that people can navigate them in a wheelchair or any other mobility device from an ADA standpoint. And it, it is important that that's available for folks that are waiting in line. Terrific. Uh, Michelle, Lisa, Brian, Pete, any questions from members of the task force? Michelle? Yeah, Jason. Um, I know you explained how you put um, maybe um, instructions on your website and such, but I was just wondering um, if there's any other way that you educated your guests on what they'll see when they come to Cedar Point. And not only that, how did you prepare your employees? Did you have classes? Did you how did you actually uh, do the instruction to them on what they were going to be performing? Yeah, so all, all of our associates this year, when they returned to work, uh, went through a special COVID training. Um, a lot of that was about their own personal health, right? Wearing a face covering, washing your hands, uh, the health screenings that we conduct uh, for our associates before they arrive. But also, it was uh, educating them on what we were going to ask the guests to do um, so that they could help reinforce. Uh, we actually gave them some scripting, the right words to use when you're reminding people things that are not used to having to follow, um, whether a mask or whether social distancing, to kind of help them feel more comfortable that they knew what they should do and what they shouldn't do. I think that was um, very critical this year. We were more specific than we've been in the past to kind of help them feel comfortable because everything was so new. Pete, along with that, you're talking about the training. I'm oh, sorry, uh, 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 Jason. Uh, along with that, you're talking about the training. And, um, you know, a lot of this is just unusual for, for all of us, right? We're all learning how to be patient with one another and how to adjust and how to, to, to deal with one another. Some people uh, may become a little emotional, right, when they're asked uh, to, to follow these guidelines. And, of course, uh, going to a park is a great family experience and something that everybody enjoys. But in, in our case, what we're talking about is a fundamental constitutional right, like something that people know that they are entitled to, that we are here to deliver for them in a safe and secure way. And so it seems like maybe role playing as part of that training is actually useful. And it seems silly at first, but it, when you do the poll worker training, uh, it seems like maybe going through, how do you deal with somebody who's a little combative? How do you say, all right, now let's calm down. Let's take a deep breath here and, and work through it in a way that that, that, that that helps to make it a pleasant experience for everybody and doesn't elevate the emotions that are already high. Yeah, when we, we talk to our teammates about that, right, our team members, um, you're definitely going to run into different different personalities and people that approach these things differently. Um, so we always talk about being respectful, but also having to hold people accountable. And like when you visit Cedar Point, just like voting, um, you're, you're not here by yourself. It's not like a consumer good that you buy. And if it didn't work exactly the right way, you can return it. Everybody's kind of in this together. I know that's kind of the... Uh, a uh, phrase that we hear on and on, but it's it's really true in these communal experiences. And and if everyone's going to enjoy the park, um, then everybody has to kind of work together to follow the guidelines for health and safety that's out there. And I think it's the same thing for voting, right? Um, and it's uh, it, it's you have to be respectful when we remind people of what our policies are and those requirements. Um, but it's important that we do you know reinforce it and hold get our guests accountable in that way. Well, and it seems to me that a lot of restaurants and a lot of um, folks that, that, that serve consumers and grocery stores and everything else have sort of presented this as a kind of a social 
contract almost like here, here's what we're doing to protect you. Here's what you should do to protect us and your fellow voters. We're working on signage that, that, that we're going to provide uh, templates for signage. And in some cases, we'll provide the, provide the actual signage for the boards of elections that sort of lay out here's here are the steps that we're taking to keep you safe. And here's your responsibility. And sort of we're all in this together. Nobody nobody likes to wear a mask. Nobody likes to stand six feet away from each other. Nobody likes to have to sanitize pens between each transaction. All of these things that we're doing are things that we have to do, not things that we want to do. And then, you know, you do your part and then we'll all get through this together and you'll be able to cast your vote, make your voice heard, and we'll send you out the door with an I voted sticker and, and everybody will be happy. All right. Good. Other questions for Jason? Yeah, Jason. I had um, one more before. Um, to, uh, you know, elections officials, I think they always expect the worst. So, Jason, I was rather surprised yesterday when you actually said how many, like, encounters or how, how, how many times you had to de-escalate a problem. And I think that's important for your company to tell on such a large um, picture on exactly how you, that they followed the rules and you haven't had that many. You know, election officials, we're thinking that's gonna be, you know, we're gonna have all these, can, that we're gonna have to diffuse, but can you talk a little bit about how people are actually and how you haven't really had as many issues as one would think at amusement park? Yeah, we, we certainly, as a culture, seem to find a way to emphasize the extremes, right? So while, while we've had a few extremes, the, the vast majority of our guests are interested in coming here and having a good time, and they understand that it's different than it was when they visited in the past. And while they do forget, right, it's because it's not human nature, um, if they do forget to, uh, after they ate, to put their mask back on, or if they do forget to socially distance, the vast majority of our guests, when approached with, you know, politely, and I thought that was important for us, we needed to tell our, um, our team members how to do that and how to approach that. Um, they've all, the vast majority have responded very favorably to that. They're, the exceptions become far and few uh, between when it's when it's come to how how guests have responded to being reminded of the policies. More often than not, there are good people out there who want to do the right thing. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, Jason. Um, you know, I mean, we're going to have lines here in our office. Um, you know, for early voting, and the lines are going to look a lot longer this time. How are you dealing with the lines looking much longer, but it's actually not? Um, are you, how are you um, getting that out to the to your you know people in line? Your yeah, that, that's one of those things that really for us the most successful way has been our team members reinforcing that right as team members walk the line and our 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 team members will sanitize as they walk the line, which is a benefit for us too. People see them cleaning, um, and then they're able just to keep reminding people, hey, this this line isn't as long as it looks. Remember, it's six feet apart. Um, we have the benefit that after people have waited in a couple, they start to experience that and realize it. You know, for us, it's been more about restaurants that maybe wouldn't have had lines that ex extend outside the restaurant. So um, if you're out in our midway, you'll hear somebody look look at a restaurant and say, oh, man, oh, the line's long. And it's like, well, just sit here for a second and watch how fast it moves. Right. And you'll um, when when you are six feet apart, you do kind of continually move a little bit more uh progressively. Um, and I always talk about that when you're in traffic, right? If you're, if the traffic's moving, you feel a lot better when you get stuck and you just are stopped there for a while. Um, so we, we keep um, verbally kind of reminding our guests that, uh, you know, watch the line, see how quickly it kind of moves along, even though it looks longer than it is, um, it, it moves more uh, frequently. Thank you. Yeah, we're definitely here in our office going to have um, you know, signs outside once we do a little, you know, quick time study, how long a wait it is from this point. I think, yeah. you know, th that's really going to help because, you know, it is intimidating when you drive up to our office and see a line, you know, wrapped around our office and it's actually really not that long. So thank you for your input. Sure. Hey, two, two things on that. I know that a number of members of the media tend to, to watch these calls and just something for, for, uh, for those who are professional journalists to consider as you're covering elections. Um, you all obviously have a responsibility to get accurate information out to your viewers and, and, and readers and listeners and that kind of thing. But uh, just 
resisting the temptation to sort of sensationalize the line and understanding the fact that uh, a, a line where people are standing six feet apart looks a lot longer. And so, you know, I, I think it's important that we report accurately uh, where there is a line. Uh, that's that's things that people need to know about, but not making it sound worse than it is. And again, this would be just sort of appealing to the good nature of folks that, that are in influencers and informers out there in our society. Uh, Jason, when we were talking yesterday, uh, I brought up the, the, the thing about you guys do a good job of sort of keeping people informed. I think people in a line are going to assume the worst, right? And, and so when, when there's a information vacuum, when you don't know what's going on, you are going to assume the worst case scenario. And you guys do a good job of saying, hey, the line, you can expect a 30 minute wait from this point. You can expect a 15 minute wait from this point. It's important that you balance that out uh, so that you don't scare people and make them think it's a longer wait than it really is, but also you need to, you know, over, uh, over deliver after under promising kind of thing on, on that. And, and maybe in the context of elections, it, it's hard to predict exactly how long chronologically the line is, but just telling people, Hey, there's only eight people in front of you, or, Hey, there's only 10 people in front of you. Is, is that something that you would suggest? Yeah. Yeah. You're right. We talked about that yesterday. If people don't have information, they, they definitely assume the worst. So uh, the more that we can communicate and, and we usually on our rides, we talk about an estimated time to ride. And uh, that's never a hundred percent accurate because there's so many variables that come into play before you get there. But giving people that kind of idea of the amount of time they'd have to wait um, is definitely better than not sharing that information. And in our restaurants and other places where we've had lines we haven't had before, just like you said, it's uh, it's almost better to quantify, hey, there's there's only five people in front of you that have to order. So um, maybe, maybe one of those orders is going to be a really long and, and big order. <laughs> so it may take a little longer, um, but at least giving people that kind of ideal um, with with the six feet distance, sometimes you don't see the the end, right? You can't see the front of the line. You're around the corner or wherever. You don't know what's on the other side. So being able to kind of share um, how many spots ahead you are, those kind of things, I think definitely helps people. Well, I think we all know the feeling of uh, when you think you're closer to the front of the line and then you <laughs> turn the corner and you see a whole new queue of people and how heartbreaking that can be. It's yeah. just sort of letting people know what the scenario is so there's no surprises when they get down one hall and turn and see oh my gosh there's another you know another right. group in front of me. lisa did you have a question i was just going to bring up the the position in line is something that we want to reiterate to people when they're coming into our early vote center our office is very small and we can only have one person in our office at the counter at a time before they go into the next door room to actually cast their ballot. So we're going to have to have something out there to let people know, hey, I'm not even to the door yet, but I'm the next person being served. So we're going to have a sign right there for that and then have someone, you know, letting people know, hey, there's only one or two people in front of you. It's not as bad as you think just because you're not in the door yet. That's awesome, Lisa. Hey, Brian, I know that you had a, a, a creative idea for keeping people informed and entertained while they were in line. I, I think that, again, that sort of useful distraction, something fun, it can be lighthearted. Would you share the idea that, that, that you guys had from back in the spring? I think this is something maybe our boards of elections could even partner with their county historical society or a local uh, community theater group or something else that's willing to do something like this. Go ahead. Yeah, we have a seasonal employee. Um, he, um, he has an Uncle Sam outfit. He loves to wear it. He goes out to fairs and all that stuff. And then he, um, he came to our office one day dressed like that, and it was a huge hit. Walking outside, you know, we obviously had long lines. Um, you know, I think it turned, you know, some people were bitter when they got in line. They were, you know, just having a bad day, had a frown on their face, and that actually helped de-escalate everything. I think it really turned some bad days into good days for people. And I, I think it just, it really helped turn everything positive for us. And, um, you know, we, we had a lot of, um, you know, media attention on it. And, um, you know, we've contacted him again this election to, um, you know, go out in our parking lot in the high volume times and do that. I mean, it was such a huge success. I can't see ever stop doing that. So. And again, there may be folks in your community that are willing to, to, to just do this on a voluntary basis. Your, your community theater group, your uh, 
your local historical society. I know I've encountered some folks out there that are like tribute uh, actors that portray uh, Abraham Lincoln or, or George Washington. Obviously, you got to keep it nonpartisan, but uh, historical figures like that, uh, you know, somebody uh, with the big, big Abraham Lincoln hat talking about how when he ran for election, people had to walk four miles to be <laughs> to vote or whatever else could be you know, entertaining. And, and actually this year, uh, as we're celebrating the hundredth anniversary of women's suffrage, uh, you know, the, the, maybe the, the the local group from the League of Women Voters or whatever would want to uh, dress up as the suffragists with the white outfits and the sashes and the red roses on their lapels and, and that kind of thing. It could be a fun thing to keep people entertained while they're in line. Other questions for Jason. Hey, one, one last one that I had, Jason, I know that you guys do a lot of audio visual type of things for people that are in lines, um, video presentations, audio presentations, you stand there and watch it, it loops every 10 minutes or whatever, telling about how they built the ride or talking about, you know, uh, some of the fun factoids about, uh, uh, you know, if you stacked a uh, hundred buses up, that's the height of the roller coaster or whatever, you know, just fun right. stuff like that, you know, it's not practical for that kind of a video presentation to be at every polling location because there's 4,000 polling locations in the state of Ohio. But for those 88 county early voting centers where, and we know the high traffic times, the weekends and that kind of thing, the after work crowd or on the, when they have the evening hours, um, if we produced a, a video, 10 minute long video that just sort of talked about the health precautions that we're taking, that reinforced some of the security steps of why they know they can trust that their ballot will be counted honestly and the bipartisan oversight of elections and and how the machines are tested before each election just sort of interesting stuff for people in line to think about to to help them be informed as voters uh, i mean do you think that would that would be useful to keep people uh, again usefully distracted while they're in line i'd love to hear your thoughts on that jason and also from our county elections officials if if, if you all have a, a cart a tv uh, on a cart that you could wheel out there and, and if we helped with a video that's something that you guys might find useful yeah that that digital screen is definitely a useful uh distraction whether it's something fun or informational usually uh the ones that we use in our two lines we try to mix it up with those kind of messages like remind uh this year we remind people of all the safety and health protocols that are in place but then we provide some behind the scenes video or sometimes it's just a music video, but different things to kind of take people's minds off the fact that they're waiting in line. But if we can educate our guests too, right, by sharing information that we know is, uh, whether it's behind the process and the, the history of the park or those kind of things, or just how to make their uh, upcoming ride experience better with some safety messages for the ride. I think anytime you have a digital um, asset that you can use, uh, there's people that will be drawn to that that will make uh, make their waiting go by more quickly. Wonderful. Well, of course, the, the best thing that we can do as elections officials all throughout the state is to remind people that the best way to avoid lines is to vote from the comfort of home using absentee ballot requests and and uh, considering going to the early voting center during those low traffic hours, uh, that, that's a, a great way to do it. But uh, we know that lines are inevitable and we wanna make sure that we're managing it in a productive way. And so uh, Jason, thank you for sharing your expertise and, and thanks not only for, for sharing your expertise today, but thanks for what your company does, again, to contribute to the, uh, to the life of our state economically and to giving families uh, a fun family activity to enjoy uh, thanks for, for all that you do. And please pass along our appreciation to the team at Cedar Fair. Will do. It's our pleasure. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, another great professional, uh, a, a member of our elections family, who is the director of the Geauga County Board of Elections. And it, it's uh, I miss being able to be out on the road as much as I used to be. Normally, I'd be in Geauga County a couple times a year enjoying some of the great maple syrup and some of the other wonderful things that you all have to offer up there. But one of the things that Geauga County has to offer is some really uh, smart solutions on poll worker recruitment. Uh, Pete and his team at the Geauga County Board of Elections have been working not only to recruit that sort of new generation of poll workers that we've been talking about, 
uh, but also to retain their their longstanding poll workers, keep them interested, keep them engaged, and uh, and make sure that they're you know willing to make that firm commitment that that they're you know committing that they will be there and we can count on them on November third and. Uh, and so, Pete, would you talk about that? And then uh, maybe we'll have some questions from your fellow elections officials about some of the things that you're that you're working on. Certainly. I'm happy to be here to represent my board and my staff and talk about what we do. And the first thing we do is we don't treat poll worker recruitment and retention like it's a periodic thing. Uh, creating a culture where poll workers are appreciated and included goes year round, especially in a smaller county where we may not have as many elections over the course of a cycle as some of the larger counties with charter communities. Uh, it involves outreach to poll workers individually and also to the community as a whole. Uh, we keep our poll workers in the loop quite often through individual communications, phone calls and emails, and we show our appreciation to the poll workers. For instance, this election is going to bring changes here in Geauga as it will everywhere else. And one of those changes involved a drastic uh, change to the way we lay out our locations to handle COVID related issues. Uh, Rather than springing that on all of our poll workers at the first training class and having to deal with uh, issues rising out of that, we wanted to bring our VLMs in and have an appreciation event for them where we could introduce them to the changes. So I went out, bought a couple of sheet pizzas, a big salad, and some drinks, and we had the folks in. And we had lunch in a room that we set up as a mock voting location, laid out the way that the new layout will. And we introduced the VLMs to the process. And as time goes on, we'll be bringing in more of our poll workers and showing them things. And our training will be designed to accentuate the new changes that we're doing. But Throughout the course of an election year or any year, uh, so much of it is the idea that poll workers have to be considered a, an essential part of the team. They're not just people we call once or twice a year and expect them to come when they're asked. I'm, I know if I only get called by people when they need me, I'm less likely to be anxious to pick up the phone and respond affirmatively to the requests. So it's important to build relationships. It's a people job. Um, I've given a lot of thought to culture as our whole staff has. We've built, and we're lucky Geauga County has a culture of civic in involvement, but at the same time, every county in Ohio has a county, has that culture. You have to make the outreach to find the pockets of civic involvement and uh, draw them into being a poll worker. I spend time at meetings, a lot of Zoom meetings this year, uh, speaking to different organizations about what we're doing and letting them know of the needs of the board. Uh, we are always involved in outreach. Our staff almost reflexively, even out in the community, when they're talking to people, they are mentioning that we're looking, we are looking for poll workers. And you know what? Right now we have a very healthy number of poll workers, but maybe it's my former experience as a poll worker coordinator. I don't believe there's such a thing as too many poll workers. I'll find a way to use it because you never know what's going to happen. And it's nice to have folks that want to be involved. What we do with elections is a great thing. And the idea of having more and more people involved is a good thing. Uh, so 
so much of what you do is just build a culture of communication and inclusion. You don't want poll workers to feel like, oh, you're a poll worker. No, you're a part of the team. We're hundreds to thousands of people, depending on the county that we're in, and we can't do this without them. So they need to feel as though they are a part of the team. And you do that through communications and building relationships. I mean, it doesn't take much to show appreciation to people. It really doesn't. I mean, it can be something as simple as a pizza lunch or a token gift or even a phone call. I mean, a lot of the poll workers appreciate it when our staff reaches out to them and it's not necessarily just right before the election. It shows that you're engaged with them and you're involved with them. And those people are going to do what you need them to do. And it goes along the lines of retention. Ret retaining poll workers is a heck of a lot easier than recruiting new ones and training them. First of all, they provide experience at the polls. They're people who know how this has worked, then there are people who will take leadership spots. Whether or not they're in a formal location manager position, they'll be leaders at the polls. They will make sure election day moves more smoothly. And then you don't have to go through as much effort to hunt out new folks if you know you've got most of your experienced folks coming back. So it's well worth the effort to incorporate uh, poll worker outreach and community outreach year round. It's, it certainly has us a lot less stressed out up here that we're not, we're not worrying about, are we going to have enough people to make this election work? That is one headache that's not on my desk. <laughs> Pete, thank you. And um, making it a year round priority, it's kind of like hygiene. You got to brush your teeth every day. You got to recruit a couple poll workers every day and just making that sort of an ongoing effort for all of your team members and your board members and the county uh, political organizations, the county Republican Party and the county Democratic Party should be fully engaged in, in this. And uh, and so thanks for, for your doing for, for all the efforts that you that you bring to it. A couple points I wanted to make. Uh, you talked about keeping people informed and engaged. And, yes. uh, you know, one idea I've had, we, we produce a lot of content from our office. We have a, a monthly uh, update email, a newsletter and a weekly newsletter that we send out that talks about the work that we're doing to make sure that it's going to be a safe environment that talks about the donations that we're receiving of personal protective equipment and hand sanitizer that talks about the work that we're doing with the Centers for Disease Control and the Ohio Department of Health. Talks about creative things like having an expert from, uh, from, from an amusement park come on and, and help us with line management so they know that they're gonna have that kind of expertise uh, to, to help them create a, a, a good situation at their polling location. Um, one idea that I've had again is that if you all are interested, you know, that, that, that weekly newsletter, that monthly newsletter that we send out from our office, obviously completely, you know, official nonpartisan kind of information that, that you all could share. And that way your poll workers have that feeling of being an insider, being a highly informed elections expert in Ohio. And, and that may be something that you want to consider, please, uh, you know, for any elections official, uh, feel free to share the, those that we send out. If you need any more guidance on that, feel free to contact our team. Uh, you guys have my email address, just frank at ohiosos.gov or, or of course, uh, any member of our communication team or your regional liaison can help you connect with, with those. Um, recognition. Uh, people like to be recognized for the work that they do. Something else that our office is happy to offer is a official proclamation celebrating somebody for years of service or uh, to recognize the the poll worker of the year, for example, the, the, the you know, maybe in December, uh, you guys uh, have a vote of your board to recognize the top Republican poll worker and the top Democratic poll worker for their efforts or, or whatever else. And then we can provide a proclamation to help make that, uh, that recognition a little bit a little bit more special. Um, I want to talk really briefly about the, the five innovative poll worker recruitment programs that our office has created. And the idea was we wanted to make these kind of turnkey uh, out of the box, just sort of take 
I'm going to start mixing my, my analogies here, but just take it off the shelf and, and use it kind of opportunities. And so these five toolkits that we've created are available on our website, voteohio.gov, not only for boards of elections to use, but for any community organization or advocacy group that wants to help us promote poll worker recruitment. And so those five distinct programs are in, in no particular order. Number one, youth at the booth, where in Ohio, 17 year olds can sign up to be poll workers. Uh, the trick on this is find a high school teacher who's willing to take this on and help encourage his or her students to sign up. Uh, that youth at the booth uh, thing is a great opportunity to get young people engaged in the process. It's a great thing to have on a college application. And so 17 year old high school seniors signing up to be poll workers is a, is, a, is a really cool thing. And I'd encourage you all to use that. And we have resources again at voteohio.gov to help you promote that, including flyers and posters that you can print off right from our website. Uh, template letters that you can send to your high school teachers and superintendents and that kind of thing. And even uh, like animations and GIFs and, and, and social media graphics and that kind of thing. The second one near and dear to me is targeted at veterans groups. I call this a second call to duty. It's that reminder that any of us that served in the armed forces made a lifelong commitment to preserve and protect the constitution. This is of course a great way to continue doing that by answering another call to duty and signing up to be a poll worker. And again, we've got uh, information about that. You can even just send a letter to all of your local VFW and American Legion halls and, and, and any other veteran service organization in your county, encouraging them to get their members to sign up. The third one is given a day for democracy where we've got template letters that you can send out to CEOs, business leaders, big and small in your community, asking them to give their employees a paid day off to be a poll worker. It's a great thing uh, and, and something that you all as elections officials can just sort of take what we've provided and put your, you know, take our template letter and print it on your letterhead and sign it and send it out uh, to those businesses in, in, in your area. And then uh, another one is uh, work a day and donate your pay. The idea being nonprofit groups need new ways to do uh, their, their fundraising this year because the fish fry or the festival or the picnic that they would normally do is kind of out the window. And so uh, he, here's an opportunity to encourage uh, supporters of your nonprofit group to sign up to be poll workers and then donate their poll worker salary as a fundraising opportunity for your nonprofit. Again, work a day and donate your pay uh, is another great one. And then finally, professional licensure groups. We've created uh, relationships with the Ohio Supreme Court, with the Accountancy Board. There are others that are in the pipeline where some of these groups are offering those continuing education credits to their members if they sign up to be poll workers. And I particularly want to highlight lawyers and accountants. Uh, any CPA in Ohio can earn continuing education credit by signing up to be a poll worker. Any lawyer in Ohio, and I really appreciate the Ohio Supreme Court for approving this uh, a few weeks ago, any lawyer in Ohio can get free continuing legal education credits for signing up to be a poll worker. So those are those are just some of the, the programs that we've made available. Again, you can take those resources right off our website. You can print them in-house. You've got flyers, you've got uh, posters, template letters, social media graphics, and get out there and use it to do your, your poll worker recruitment. Uh, what questions do we have from the members of the task force for Pete about the work that he's doing on poll worker recruitment? Michelle, Lisa, Brian? Anything? Uh, one of the, say, yeah, Lisa, go ahead. go ahead. I was gonna say, do you do something, you were talking about recognition. I know we do like a pin for our poll workers each election. Do you do something that's like a nominal gift for for your poll workers other than just having like the get together? We don't, and it, it can be, we have different things that we do for each election. Uh, sometimes it's simple as just we reach out, we send a, thank you letter I and mean, it doesn't take a lot to keep people engaged people want to be appreciated and we thought well thought we find different ways of doing it and we're always considering new ways to do it and i think after this election there'll probably be something different because this is a very different election so i'll sit down with my staff we'll figure out which work what which idea works best and uh talk to my board and we'll probably find some way to show everyone just how important they are in the process. Hey Pete, it's Michelle. I was just wondering, um, do you utilize social media then? For an example, we want, we have several calls about, you know, uh, what our process is uh, going to be of keeping them safe 
and we go through that. So we actually put on our Facebook, we did a picture of Mandy with all her PPE on what would be if we were curbside. And, um, and uh, we showed our caddy for our uh, sanitizing specialists what they would actually carry. Do you use social media then to reach out and uh, like your Facebook account for your poll workers? We, we will be using it more. Uh, to this point, our communication with the poll workers has been more direct. I mean, we through emails, like before the survey was mandated, we had already reached out to our poll workers and that outreach included information about the PPE and the policies that we were implementing in order to make sure that they were going to be safe. Uh, part of building that relationship is being proactive on reaching out and mm -hmm. rather than relying on them to look at social media, uh, a direct email and in some cases direct phone calls jump the line. <laughs> Lisa, did you have something you wanted to ask? I, I did, but <laughs> <laughs> um, we, he was talking about a lot of the things, so I didn't need to ask any more questions on it. Thank you. <laughs> hey, hey, one thing, Pete, that came to mind, and, and any of you that, 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 uh, that, that may do this at the local level, uh, feel free to, to, to pop in. Um, it's good to get recognition again for the fact that that people need to sign up to be poll workers and what a valuable service it is. I think we have a tradition as a nation of stepping up. Uh, certainly, I think Ohio has that tradition when there's a when there's a tornado, people show up with their chainsaws and and they help out. You know, and when there's a a need for uh, when there there's some sort of violence uh, that occurs, people want to donate blood or there's, you know, I mean, there, there are just all these things that people come together to try to serve their fellow Ohioans when there's a time of need. And I think that we uh, coming into the next month or so can really highlight that this is an opportunity to serve and really do something useful and to help us defend democracy. I mean, there's a reason why we set up the poll worker recruitment website that we use statewide as voteohio.gov slash defend democracy. And we're, it's not dramatic to say that's exactly what you're doing when you sign up to be a poll worker to help us make sure that we can run a, an election uh, even amidst a, a pandemic. Um, as far as recognition goes, it, it seems like at the board level, at the county level, maybe reaching out to your local newspaper, or if you're in a larger county, reaching out to your local TV station and seeing if they might be willing to do just a human interest story. Uh, you may have something like a multi-generational thing where you know, you've got the kid that just turned uh, 18 this year or 17. Uh, you've got mom and, and you've got grandma that all have, have a tradition of being poll workers and, and talking about that and maybe getting a, seeing if you can get a front page newspaper story or that, that veteran who just returned uh, from time in the military and she decides that she wants to continue serving by signing up to be a poll worker. And it could be a neat sort of human interest story about that. Uh, have any of you had any luck with that? And again, it, it doesn't hurt to ask. You, you guys have relationships with your local newspaper editors, uh, with the assignment editors at your local TV stations or radio stations, just reaching out to them and seeing if they would be willing to highlight that and kind of, you know, glamorize this work a little bit it, by just really highlighting what it is. Has anybody had any experience with that? Do you guys think that would be something interesting? Do you think your local paper might be willing to cover it? Well, it's certainly been effective in terms of outreach to the media in recruiting. Prior to the primary, uh, obviously most boards were losing people, but as soon as media became aware of the dramatic need, at least in our area, they became very much allies in trying to fill the need. and. Up here, we had a lot of success with that. We we were ready for primary day. <laughs> yeah, we all were, and uh, and that was obviously a experience for, for for all of us. Whereas the state, we were, you know, in the midst of making all of these preparations because the experts at both the state and federal level had told us that we were going to go forward. And then, of course, the governor made a, a different decision just the day before. And 
um, you know, we had really pulled together. I mean, there were the number statewide was over 3000 new poll workers that were recruited and trained just in the days leading up. And it was an amazing effort. And by the way, those folks that signed up, those 3000 who signed up just in the final days before the scheduled March 17th Ohio primary, uh, hopefully we're, we're reaching out to them uh, because they've already shown us that they have an interest. They've already expressed an interest. I know my, my little brother was one of them. He's a university student at the University of Akron. And he signed up at the Summit County Board of Elections to be a poll worker, and and uh, and and I hope that they've already reached out to him. In fact, I'm going to check with him today to make sure they have. But uh, it's uh, it's one of those things where people have already told us back in March that they're interested. We should be reaching out to, to all of them. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. One last thing, and, and Michelle, I think you had an example of this. Um, there are jobs to do that don't yes. necessarily require an official poll worker. Obviously, you have to be a trained precinct election official, if you're going to be handling ballots, if you're going to be checking IDs, checking people in, mm -hmm. assisting voters with the specifics of how to fill out their ballot, that requires a trained poll worker. But you know what? The greeter that welcomes people or the person at the door that hands out the I voted sticker um, or even the people that are working at the Board of Elections on election night to help collect in the, the materials and, and bring people in after their, their, the poll workers are returning back to the board with all of their equipment uh, and ballots and memory cards and everything else, you can use other groups. And, and I, you know, 4-H clubs, Girl Scout groups, Boy Scout groups, the local Rotary Club, uh, folks that, that, that you know, they, they may not want to go through the whole training or make the whole day commitment to be a poll worker, but you can put them to work in a sort of unofficial capacity as a election day volunteer. Michelle, would you talk about that? Yeah, and it, it's like one feeds off the other. Like we talk about youth at the booth. And then I was talking to the uh, National Honor Society instructor where those students need to get their community service hours. So then we had a couple Honor Society students come in and do work in the office here prior to help us prepare. Um, it was actually once you start doing um, any type of social media or I was on a noontime edition and we got like 12 poll workers the hour after I was on that. And then an idea will generate from that. We actually had, I speak at the Rotary, so there may be the Girl Scout leader there. So then the Girl Scout leader actually approached us saying, I have 11 15-year-old girls. How can we help? This is part of a project. We'd like to come tour your office. And then they can be in those jobs. And like we said, how cool would that be with their Girl Scout you know, outfits on passing out stickers and also um, just, you know, constant communication. Today, I was approached about, will I speak at a rotary? Well, I know what's happened here in my community. They've all got those absentee applications. So everyone has those answers or those questions. So now we said, we're going to, I'm going to do a myth bust Monday at the rotary, you know, on the 28th. And then that will also, because it's just natural then to go into the poll worker need and discuss that. So it's always, like you said, year round working on it when you're maybe there for to discuss something else, but to always encourage that and ask. And even if you have more than you need, we'll find spots for them because we want to actually retain and then use them again for the next year's. That's terrific. It's uh, it's a great way to get people involved, and, and uh, I, I love the uh, I love the approach that, that, that you all are, are taking there. Um, any other questions or, or, or issues to bring up? Uh, actually, here's one that I just thought of. We have uh, obviously heard some concern about you know the, the, we've been asking uh, back to the postage paid issue on absentee ballot return envelopes. Uh, you know we've been asking the legislature to do that since April and and uh, haven't gotten anything from them yet. Hopefully they're still willing to approve this in September, uh, but it's gonna require some work at the boards, obviously some last minute work to make sure that you can put that postage on those envelopes. And that's kind of a, a time consuming manual task. Uh, the idea that, that came to mind for me is, you know, maybe reaching out to your county MRDD uh, to get some of those great Ohioans involved in, in a job that they can help with. Putting stamps on envelopes seems like something that with the right supervision, uh, folks like that could be helpful with. And so that's just a, another way that we can get people involved. Of course, you're going to need to bring in your, your extra augmentees and your, your part-time staff and that kind of thing. But maybe some of those manual jobs 
Uh, some of that kind of uh, simple repetitive work could be done by, by others as well, like putting postage stamps on absentee return envelopes if we're able to get uh, permission from the state legislature for my office to provide those stamps. So that's, a, that's another idea. Uh, anything else as we get ready to wrap up? Uh, Brian, Michelle, Lisa, Pete, any closing thoughts? All right. Thank you very much for having everybody on, especially, you know, the, you know, knowing how to manage lines and seeing how it's done at a larger level, you know, is um, really helpful to us at the DOEs. Absolutely. Well, the, the boards of elections bring a lot of creativity and passion to the work that they do. And it's because of you all that we will have a successful election this fall and the people of Ohio will have the chance to make their voice heard in a, uh, in a safe and, and, uh, and an honest way. And so uh, with that, um, thank you so much to members of the task force. Thank you, Pete, for joining us. Uh, really appreciated having Jason McClure on earlier from uh, Cedar Fair. And that'll wrap up our September 3rd meeting of the Ready for November task force. And next time we meet, it'll be post Labor Day. And so we will be into game season, uh, game time for sure for us as elections officials. The excitement is building. The uh, absentee ballot requests are starting to hit. And uh, the time has come for us to shine because that's exactly what we do when it's time to hold an election. And so God bless each and every one of you and thanks for the work you do and uh, see you next time. Take care. Thanks.